Hello and welcome to Classically Imperfect, an organization dedicated to providing mental health and wellness resources to young classical musicians. I'm Mary Lizalde, the founder and executive director, and today I'm joined by Tim Lord, the co-executive director of DreamYard. Today we'll be discussing the importance of centering youth voice and arts education programs. Hi Tim, how are you? Hi Mary, I'm doing well. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you for asking. Let's just get right into it. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what DreamYard is? Sure. Um, so, uh, as you said, my name is Tim Lord. I'm the co-founder and co-executive director of DreamYard. We're an arts and social justice education organization in the Bronx. Uh, we work with uh, young people, families, schools, and communities to build pathways to equity and opportunity. And obviously, we choose those words extremely carefully. We're a, a, an organization that does our work through an anti-racist, pro-justice lens. And we work at the intersection of arts and social justice. Um, just briefly, uh, what our programs are in the Bronx, uh, we work with about 45 public schools, helping them build arts and social justice programs as part of the school day. So in class, uh, where our teacher teaching artists um, work side by side with teachers to build projects in the curriculum. Um, through that, we also run after school programs. Uh, we started a high school. It's a public high school. It's not a charter school called the Dream Yard Prep High School, which is amazing. And I'll talk about it uh, you know, later on in our conversation. Um, we have two community spaces. One is for more traditional art forms. And then we have a gaming and entrepreneurship space. And they're all close to each other. So we like to, we, we like to think we're starting to build a campus for arts and social justice uh, in the Bronx. And, um, and then fa finally, and we can talk about these programs in a minute because it really connects to the idea of Youth Voice. Our most recent initiative has been to lean into building career pathways programs to really help young people as early as um, ninth grade begin to make the connection between the work that they're doing around arts and social justice mm -hmm. uh, and the idea that you can build a life, uh, a family sustaining career from the work that, that you love to do that I love to do. Yeah, that's great. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the specific arts program? Like, are there music? Is there dance? Like, things like that? We don't have a huge music program, which is one of the reasons that I really love speaking with you. Um, and and uh, you know, and and I I, I love meeting you in Los Angeles. Um, I feel like there is so much we can learn from working with or, or, uh, organizations that do community uh, music programs. Mm -hmm. uh, our our programs, we have a wonderful theater program, a poetry and spoken word program, uh, a wonderful dance program, uh, visual arts. Uh, and then we have a gaming program, which really is, in many ways, a way into um, a whole whole host of art forms, um, uh, but th really through the digital and design lens. Yeah, definitely. Um, and it's also like really important to have like different types of arts that kids can explore. How do you think this program is distinct from other pre-college or after-school programs in New York? I know in, in New York, there's like the Juilliard pre-college and Manhattan School of Music and different dance conservatories. How is StreamYard specifically different? So a couple of ways. Um, one is that uh, we uh, lean into a year-long residencies and also into building pathways. So the many of the young people we work with start working with us as early as elementary school, and we'll work with them through middle school. They'll start coming to our community spaces. They might go to the Dream Yard High School. They'll get paid internships through us. So there are all, lots of on-ramps and also a, a whole host of opportunities the young people can be involved with until they head off to college and begin to build a post-secondary career. And then we hire many of our young people uh, as uh, what we call legacy, and in, legacy interns mm -hmm. uh, who become... Uh, apprentice teaching artists and apprentice arts administrators, um, really leaning into building um, pathways to uh, arts administrators of color uh, from the Bronx, which is a, a, an area that we need to lean into further in this country. Um, the other thing that makes us different besides the idea of the pathways is the ways in which we define arts and social justice and the way that they intersect. Um, and it's it's deceptively simple and therefore I think really powerful. Um, so for us, arts and social justice education begins with looking at the root causes of injustice. Uh, we work in a neighborhood that was redlined for many years, um, which as you know, uh, uh, means that uh, based on a federal law that was passed in the 1930s, banks were allowed to deny mortgages uh, based on the race, uh, predominant race of the communities uh, in which they were denying those mortgages. And so, 
Um, and they would draw a red line around a neighborhood and say, you know, we're not, the bank doesn't need to invest in that neighborhood. And obviously there's incredible trickle down effect of that. And it's really at the heart, one of the sort of interconnected pieces that's at the heart of institutional and systemic racism, you know, the, the which we continue to see obviously in, in this country today, but that, uh, finally, I think we're, we're more explicitly beginning to address and take on and have conversations about. So, in our programs, starting with the youngest years, there are ways to take a look at the fact that um, that there are root causes to injustice. And as a sidebar to that, uh, Mary, one of the things that's really powerful is when you start to look at the root causes of injustice, young people start to realize that it's not their fault, mm -hmm. right? I think people, all of us can internalize our conditions. And so um, people can internalize the way their neighborhood looks and somehow that it's what they deserve. Well, when you start to say, no, there are, there are root causes, institutional causes to why, the, um, why your neighborhood is not invested in, why your public schools are not invested in, it becomes a call to action mm -hmm. and it becomes very liberating. So the looking at root causes is one thing, but we, what we pair that with, which I, which I find tremendously powerful at DreamYard, is also uplifting culture and community. So it's the history of a community. The Bronx is one of the richest, uh, most diverse, most joyous, most musical uh, uh, places in, in the country. And so we lift up the history of the community and we also lift up the culture of the young people, cultures of the young people we, we work with. And that means the artists we're looking to, the music we're looking at, the poets we're reading as inspiration. And so you combine all of those elements um, with a final piece, which is that artists are always reimagining the world that they want to see. Uh, yeah. And I think those elements uh, are what makes uh, Dream Yard's work really uh, powerful and unique. Yeah, that's really beautiful. And I think really honing in on like the holistic aspect of a student and like their entire life and where they came from is also really important into what they're doing with their art and what you said about like career and like building these career pathways that's something that really lacks in music and as I stated like before when we were at um the symposium in music it's kind of just like they give you one one route for a a job for your future and kind of it's kind of like if you don't fit into that then you kind of like have to leave music behind but I really love what you guys are doing like you you're giving your students the opportunity to explore and expand and giving them the resources needed and I had no idea that you guys had paid internships and things like that and um I think it's it's really beautiful do you participate in mental health and wellness conversations at dream yard and if not how can you incorporate these conversations into your program Thank you for that question. And I, I really love the work that you're doing, Mary, and, you know, looking into Classically Imperfect and the work that you all, you're you doing in terms of supporting this conversation, but then also really leaning into the ways in which we can support young people and, and young artists and musicians with mental health and wellness is incredibly powerful. Um, so congratulations. Thank you. Um, yeah. You know, it's interesting because uh, one of the things that we have been um, working on at DreamYard really explicitly is being an anti-racist organization. And I'm, I'm going to take you back a little bit um, because I think it's an important part of the journey is, mm -hmm. you know, DreamYard was founded by two white men with a lot of privilege, myself and my partner, Jason Duchin, and we work with 100% young people of color. So there are some black women who were running really important parts of our business, uh, of our work. Uh, Robin Walker Murphy was a founding director of the Art Center, one of our community spaces. Mm -hmm. Renee Watson, who's a, who's a just amazing author, uh, she was our first director of professional development. And one of the women she worked closely with is a woman named Ama Kojo, who's an incredible educator and poet. They came to Jason and me really explicitly about 15 years ago and said, you know, we are an organization that works with 100% young people of color. You are two white men with a tremendous amount of privilege. You need to start to understand why you made that choice. And you need to start to, and they said this with as as which is an, with a real sense of invitation, which is an incredibly generous per thing for a person of color to do to say to a white person to invite them into this work. You know, it should have been me who was figuring that out, yeah. but they, they they invited me in and said, you know, you need to begin to understand what it means to be an anti-racist, and concurrently, we're going to start to build out. Um, for DreamYard, what that means as an organization in terms of being explicitly anti-racist and really understanding what social justice pedagogy means to us. And so 
We began an ongoing uh, uh, work at DreamYard, which has culminated, and it's a it's a really powerful journey that started with sort of yearly get-togethers, and then we realized, no, this is work that has to happen every day. So now, instead of staff meetings, we have what we call learning community, where we, as a as a full time staff, do work explicitly examining uh, anti racism both within our own organization in terms of how can we change our practices to live what we profess mm -hmm. and also obviously understanding how it impacts our schools and our communities and education and all the intersections uh, you know that you might find so what's fascinating about adam mary is that as we as we've done that work it's become more and more clear that wellness is a really core aspect of anti-racist work mm -hmm. uh, it's a really key aspect to building a just uh, society and a just community. Um, because the trauma and the stress that falls disproportionately on people of color in this country, whether it be young people or staff members at DreamYard, you have to fight that really explicitly. It's something that I have learned and am continuing to learn. So wellness and mental health and understanding trauma I have become really at the core of a lot of the work that we're doing in our learning community. Um, and I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, we break into teams and people are allowed to choose which team they want to work on based on their interests at DreamYard to really address these issues in terms of how they live within our uh, uh, company. Mm -hmm. And so from that work, which we call our racial justice projects, we've developed a sabbatical structure so that everybody at DreamYard can apply to do take a pay two or three months sabbatical and rest mm -hmm. or explore something that's creative or explore some aspect of their self they've always wanted to explore. So we've built in the idea of rest, paid rest, mm -hmm. uh, being part of your career at DreamYard. Mm -hmm. um, we have a team that's working specifically on wellness um, and offering wellness advice and offering yoga classes. And um, we have another team that's working on how do we take what we call a, a digital um, uh, break uh, daily and even monthly where we aren't on Zoom and we aren't having meetings so that people can either lean into the work they've needed to do, but they always get caught up in meetings or, or just take the time to rejuvenate. And so we're having ongoing conversations of, about uh, mental health and wellness and really um, baking that in um, to the way we work with each other. One of the things that we need to do more of, though, is I think explicitly figure out how we can do that in terms of supporting our young people. Yeah. Uh, we do have one of our directors of our professional development team. We invest heavily in our professional development team that supports our teaching artists and the teachers they work with uh, and doing their work. Uh, uh, Sandra Lees, um, um is the director of the dance department, um, and um, she also is a trained uh, arts therapist. So we've been able to embed that, and we um, she provides workshops to our teaching artists and, and helping them understand how to support our young people. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think there's more we can do. Yeah, I think for me, like personally, the whole reason that I got into like musicians specifically was seeing the actual um, problems within my community. I think that's the first like step or like piece of advice that I would give to you is like, for example, when I was growing up, I had a lot of pain in my upper back and um, in the classroom, like we didn't really talk about like what to do when you feel injured or like we didn't have any conversations of injury at all. And I just thought it was really weird because like for the next couple of years, I would just have to be dealing with this back pain and like have no solution. And it's just simple conversations like that, that I wish I could have had when I was learning my instrument and things like that. And now that I'm like beginning these conversations and people are like relating to it, I think that was the initial first step that I took to see if other people within my community had these issues. And especially since classical music is like, has a great stereotype that it's so rigorous and so mentally draining. I think that's where it initially came from. I know in dance, there's a lot of stereotypes about like eating disorders and, and things like that. So I think really honing in and asking the students what they want to see or like if what they're feeling, I think that's the, the best first step that you can take. Um, and it's also very a very sensitive thing. So I don't know, maybe talking to them one-on-one -on -one and like seeing where 
that goes on, but I don't think you need a professional to start these conversations. I think the students, if they're feeling something and they have this safe space and like this safe community that I think Dream Yard is, then I think they would be sharing their concerns. And not everyone like, you know, has these concerns. Not every musician grew up the same way that I did or grew up with issues that they wish were taught about in the classroom, you know? So I think yeah. that's like the most important piece that I'd say. And also, um, it's not the reality for every musician. That's what I would say as for like the student voice part of it. Yeah, no, it's incredibly um, powerful and, and something that I'm going to take back to our team because, mm -hmm. um, you know, we do provide, Sandra Lee has a space at our art center and she does do one-on-ones with students and also group work. But, you know, it's interesting. I think knowing that something is available doesn't necessarily equate to young people taking advantage of that. And a, yes, most people do feel I think the vast, vast majority of the young people we work with see Dream Yard as a home and a safe space. And it's one of the things that's so incredibly powerful, I think, about the, the, our team and the, and the spaces that we've created is people think of it as a space that they can come back to long after they've graduated, right? Mm -hmm. That being said, I, I think what you just said about just making sure that we are making and taking a moment to reflect on our, if we're asking those questions, some of the questions that you're, uh, you're, you're mentioning about how are you feeling or what do you need? Mm -hmm. Is there anything you want to say? If so, you know, you have, you can have these one-on-one -on -one conversations. Encouraging that dialogue, I think is a really good thing to remind ourselves of. Yeah. And like I said, I think what you guys are doing is like amazing. And I think you guys have the community. And if your students like were struggling, I think from everything that I've heard, they would tell you about it. So I think you guys are doing a great job. Um, and it's just just being conscious of maybe that one kid who might be going through it and might not, you know, really yeah. want to talk about that. But that leads me to my next question. Um, how is DreamYard building change makers and implementing the importance of student voices? Do you have any advice to help other young programs implement these crucial conversations? Yeah, that's such a great question. I love, you know, you sent me the questions ahead of time and I'm, I was so excited that you sent me uh, these. Mm -hmm. I think there are a couple of ways that we explicitly lean, lean into making sure that we are centering youth voice. And one is that we don't ever add a new program or grow any pro a new program at DreamYard without having had um, intense conversations with our young people. Mm -hmm. And so I honestly believe that that's why DreamYard growth in the Bronx and development has felt so embedded in community and has 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 uh, developed in a way that feels um, effective in terms of working with young people is because we develop it with them and from young people's sensibilities. Mm -hmm. And that, that that happens in formal ways, you know, through meeting with young people at the end of each program or at the end of each school year at the high school. It also comes from uh, from explicitly building um, conversations with young people whenever we think about growing. So, for example, you know, we we built our our high school, the public high school, basically because young people said, "I don't have a place to go to high school where I can do arts and social justice work in the Bronx. I'd need to go to Manhattan if I wanted to do that." Yeah. So we grew it from young people asking for that. Um, the career pathway stuff, the same way. We'd be having uh, you know formal reflection conversations with some of our alumni and they'd say you know we got off to college and you know we feel like we've been sold a set bill of goods i mean everybody just said go to college go to college go to college and i get there and i'm building up debt and i don't know why i'm there mm -hmm. we realized we said well we ha what would help and so we had this whole conversation they said i didn't realize that i could do the stuff that i love doing with you that it could open doors for me to be a teaching artist, to be an artist, to be a designer if I'm a visual artist, to be a music production engineer if I've been a musician, to, you know, on and on and on and on and on, you know. And as you said, ways to be connected to the art forms and the art we love, either as an artist uh, or as as somebody, you know, more of the production side or the and so those com types of conversations has ha have been the things that have led us as we have de 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 designed our programs. And I think that's a super important thing. And that's connected to the importance of taking moments to reflect. Mm -hmm. And we all get really busy. You know, when we're young, uh, young organizations and organizations like DreamYard that have been around for uh, 30 years, mm -hmm. you know, we get so busy, we get caught up in our day to day. It's really, really important to take a moment uh, a couple of times a year and to reflect and ask questions and say, are we on the right track? Mm -hmm. You know, what, what do you need? 
And so those reflection moments are, are what leads to some of those good decisions that I think we've made in terms of growing our programs. Two other quick things I want to mention is, you know, so for an example of how this can be incredibly powerful, we just applied for a grant to um, to really invest in and in, in grow our art center, the Dream Yard Community Art Center. And it, is, it was built about 15 years ago. And, and in essence, it's a beautiful space because we have beautiful artwork in there, but it's really just a lot of boxes, you know, and there's a dance class, but it doesn't have a strong, sprung dance floor. And there are visual arts rooms, which, you know, They've got some tables and some some good visual arts materials, but they're not a visual art space. And we realized our young people deserve to have top quality spaces, just like any young person does. And I like you for you as a musician, a, a wonderful rehearsal space, a wonderful performance hall, and a great instrument. Those are important pieces for young artists, you know. And so we're investing in redoing our space. We hope if we get the grant, not mm -hmm. and in the design process, we made sure to center young people. What kinds of spaces do you want? What what makes a space feel inspirational to you? What do you want it to look like and feel like? And you know, and we had professional architects working with us, but they drew all their inspiration from working with young people with our teaching artists together. Um, and so, I think those are super important ways to center youth voice. And, and I know I'm going on for a, a while, but I wanted to bring up one other thing, if I may, Mary. Yeah, yeah, of course. So. One of the other ways that we have centered youth voice and youth leadership, um, specifically at the Dream Yard Prep High School, is by um, committing to um, being a, 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 a community centered on restorative justice practices. And what that has looked like and what it looks like is that we have juniors and senior leaders who are trained as circle keepers and restorative justice leaders. And we do everything in circles at the high school. So Every, every unit and every class culminates in a conversation about a topic or a theme that they've been discussing. The teacher poses a question and steps out of the circle and the young students speak to each other, which seems deceptively simple, but think about how often in high school everybody's talking to the teacher or through the teacher as opposed to each other. And so we build this muscle of young people really leading the conversation. And then those junior and senior leaders lead um, town halls where they in a mixed group of nine to 12th graders will lead a conversation around bullying or around the, the challenges and the, uh, uh, and the, you know, the, the, the war in, in Palestine and, and, and um, really difficult conversations. Um, and uh, the, they will have student led and student integrated conversations where young people, again, are learning that muscle to, to, to be the sort of builders of community. And then if there's ever something that happens, even as complex as a big fight in the school, which doesn't happen much anymore, but was happening in the early days, it's the students with a couple of teachers supporting who actually work through how we're gonna repair the community. And we don't have suspensions anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's all student led. And you know, what's interesting about it is when you build a community with that um, belief and the power of young people to build community and to and to care for each other. A lot of times with things that used to become issues in the high school get diffused because a young person will go to one of the students' leaders, the juniors or seniors, and say, you know, I'm really having a tough time can, with Mary. Can you help me figure it out? And they'll get us together. And it mm -hmm. all gets worked out in a way um, before it becomes something that people can't control. Yeah, I think that's... That's really, leadership is really important, especially for like teenagers. And I think it, it gives them another route outside of what, what they thought they were capable of. And, um, I don't think everyone in like my program gets to be a leader. I feel like in, in music, it's very like, there's only like the principles of each, of each section that, and like, that's considered the leader and it's not really taught among the other students, but mm -hmm. I feel like if it was more centered towards the students, like your organization, then I think it would, it would really like broaden um, the different leaders within our, our orchestra. And I also think that one thing I wanted to mention earlier was not every organization or program is perfect. And I think really the organization and like the program honing in on what to improve and what to make it better for the students is probably the most important thing because Great. I know a lot of programs forget 
like they become this great program with a bunch of resources, but they forget that their main focus is the students and it gets lost in translation. And all of a sudden they start caring more about what our next concert is rather than, you know, the students. And I think that's something that I'm noticing a lot more recently. And I think with your program and how you're focusing on getting these grants for your students and providing new resources for your students, I think that's really a great important part of their education because in the end it is all about the student and the students learning and I just really appreciate like everything that you're doing and I think it's really great and yeah um, this leads me to my last question I know you're not a musician or your program isn't really centered about the music um, community but do you believe there are enough mental health and wellness resources in the music community or in your organization or we can That's take a great oh sorry go ahead oh i was just gonna say we can take this multiple ways since it's not your organization is not really music related but yeah i i don't know the music or community music um um world as well as you do but i think from what i see from other arts and social justice education organizations and and dream yard included I think that uh, I have a lot of hope and optimism because people are having explicit conversations about the importance of wellness and which for me, you know, wellness and, and, and I, I know this isn't a full definition, but I think the emphasis on wellness is an emphasis on how important it is to think about the whole human being and to think about mental health and emotion and trauma almost in a preventative sense, right? That if we're learning meditation, if we're doing yoga, if we're asking each other questions about how we are, if we're building empathy, um, then, you know, you know, we're helping people uh, um, before they get into crisis, right? Um, and then if someone does get into crisis, you need to have the supports uh, people need to take care of themselves and to learn how to be resilient and, and to get through the traumas and to hopefully, um, you know, uh, mend and, 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 you know, continue to grow because we all have crises in our lives, right? We all have moments of, of doubt or, or anxiety or depression or, or, um, you know, we all have those difficult moments and, 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 uh, so it's, it's the wellness, which I think allows us to be, to be cared for so that we can manage those crises a little bit better. Mm -hmm. And then when we get into crisis support supports we need, I think the fact that we're having those conversations, Mary, is super important. Mm -hmm. We first started doing this work at DreamYard, or even as recently as 10 or 15 years ago, it wasn't an explicit conversation the way it is now. So we're headed in the right direction. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is I don't think that people are putting enough emphasis nearly in the in how much it takes to do that work well. And that means that administrations, leaders like I do, like me, need to make sure that we're having those conversations with our uh, staff. Mm -hmm. We need to talk to funders about it and say, look, you need to make sure that each of these organizations has the resources they need to support young people in these ways. You know, um, we need to talk about it in terms of the career aspect. You know, as you were saying, it's you know, it's not about sort of having a stiff upper lip and your, your shoulders hurt, but you're the bet, you know, you're an amazing violinist and you just keep going. How does this become something that is healthy for somebody both mentally and, and physically? And so I think it's really going to take a concerted effort to move it from conversation to actually investing in it. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I think as for like myself, um, I'm definitely seeing more conversation within different like conservatories and things but at the same time I have last summer I went to the New England Conservatory for a, a summer program and I saw like a bunch of like posters about mental health and wellness and things like that but at the same time I'm like thinking to myself do these students actually use these resources or are are these resources really centered towards the student or is it more kind of just for show and things like that and it's it's something that I've really been thinking about a lot and every conservatory student that I've encountered and I've talked about like how how are you doing like mentally and it's always the same answer like they're usually not okay and they're usually struggling and I think to have these conversations is the first step to help these musicians and then from there I think that's where the change really happens and we start to see um, organizations like yours and um, hopefully YOLA and different organizations around the country implement these for the future of classical musicians um yeah yeah i totally agree i mean it's going to be 
it's going to be that those moments where it moves beyond, you know, we're talking about it or it's theoretical or we're offering the services to really embedding it in our practices, right? And so everybody's asking, even during rehearsals, making sure everybody's okay, you know? Definitely. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, and if you want to learn more about Classically Imperfect, make sure to click the link in our bio. Bye. Thanks, Mary.